everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. We're just going to begin in a couple of minutes, so hang tight. But we're glad everybody is able to join us today. We're excited to hear um, from some trailblazing speakers here that we have. So just hold on tight once again, everyone. If you're just coming in, thank you for joining us. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. We're gonna get started in a couple of minutes, so hang tight, but we're excited to have you guys here today. Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Welcome if you're just coming in. Once again, we're gonna go ahead and get started in a couple of minutes. So just hang tight. But in a couple of minutes, we're gonna go ahead and move into land acknowledgement. And then we'll hear from Yossi Mad, um, our moderator. And then we're gonna get into our panelists. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome. Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for coming once again. For those of you guys that are just coming in, we're gonna get started with the land acknowledgement in a couple of seconds. But thank you for coming. We're happy to have you guys all here and we're excited to go ahead and start our panel. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start with the land acknowledgement. But first of all, we wanna thank everybody once again. Thank you everyone for coming to our Latinx Leadership for Change panel. We're excited to have you guys all here. We're thankful you guys were all able to make it out today. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our panel. But first we're gonna go ahead and Do the Kumeyaay land acknowledgement because as many guys may know or may not know, SDSU does reside on Kumeyaay land and we um, want to go ahead and acknowledge that and we'll go ahead and do that. I'm the tribal liaison of San Diego State University and I'm now going to read the Kumeyaay land acknowledgement. We stand upon a land that carries the footsteps of millennia of Kumeyaay people. We are a people whose traditional life ways intertwine with a worldview of earth and sky. In a community of living beings, this land is part of a relationship that has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced the Kumeyaay people to the present day. It is part of a worldview founded in the harmony of the cycles of the sky and the balance and the forces of life. For the Kumeyaay, red and black, represent the balance of those forces that provide for harmony within our bodies, as well as the world around us. As students, faculty, staff, and alumni of San Diego State University, we acknowledge this legacy of the community. We promote this balance in life as we pursue our goals of knowledge and understanding. We find inspiration in the community spirit to open our minds and hearts. It is a legacy of the red and black. It's a land of the community. Yeah, honey, my heart is good. In your womb, in your pockets. And now I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to our board member, Serena. All 
Alrighty, thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Serena. I'm the VP of LSU. So I'm just going to go um, through an overview of our agenda. The first thing we're going to do is uh, the panelist presentations. Then we're going to go on to a discussion moderated by Yosima Reyes. Then we're going to have a Q&A for you guys just to uh, pop questions in the chat. And then lastly, um, we're going to have a presentation of a plaque to um, Dolores Huerta. And then um, we just wanted to share our purpose of the Latinx Student Union. Our purpose is to unite, educate, and empower Latinx students through the celebration of culture and the promotion of positivity, mentorship, purpose, and awareness in all that we do. So now I am going to pass it off to Yosimar Reyes. And um, Yosimar Reyes is a nationally acclaimed poet and public speaker, born in Guerrero, Mexico, and raised in Eastside San Jose. Reyes explores the themes of migration and sexuality in his work. Reyes has toured and presented at university campuses across the United States. He is currently working on his one-man show, Prieto, to, to premiere in the near future. Reyes holds a BA in creative writing from San Francisco State University. And yeah, now I present to you, Rosy, uh, Yosimar. Um, buenas noches, everybody. Es un placer estar aquí con ustedes. I am so honored and elated that we are here together um, to begin this amazing conversation with um, Latinx leaders in our community. Um, before we do that, I will start off with a poem. I am a poet and a writer, so um, I want to start off with this poem. Um, and one, I think one of the things that we are witnessing right now is that we're coming off a really rough year, right? And I think for me, as somebody that's a poet and has bear witness to kind of what's happening within our communities, I specifically being part of um, the undocumented community, I wrote this poem um, being that I felt like we needed some sort of love sometimes or just a reminder of the fact that, you know, we are indeed powerful. So this poem is titled A Poem So the Weight of This Country Does Not Crush You. Um, and it goes like this. Some days you may wake up sad, some days you may wake up frustrated. Some days you may wake up tired. Some days you may wonder if it's worth it. Some days you may question your own growth. Some days you may think how immense the world is to be caged in this country, to be subjugated to this abuse. Some days you just want to breathe and baby I am here to remind you to sit in those moments, to sit in that whirlpool, but just know there are people like me picking up the load when you can't. There are people like me pushing so the weight of this country does not crush you. And there are people like you who will fight when I can't and we will take turns pushing against all these walls. I got your back and you got mine. And in the scheme of things, does anything else matter? Even if our fight is unfruitful, we will depart with our dignity intact. We will depart knowing that this country is losing a price procession. This country is losing the gift of our resilience. We will watch them as they tear into each other's skins and we will thank the heavens we never turn into beasts like them. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just wanna take the time to acknowledge that since we are living in the Zoom virtual world and there is Zoom fatigue and, and all the whole host of things that we are up against, um, you taking the time to be here and be part of this conversation and bear witness to, uh, to this conversation, it means a lot. So thank you, thank you so much uh, for showing up. Um, over the last year, we have witnessed the ways in which the coronavirus has impacted Latino communities as at a disproportionate rate. We have also bear witness on how the Black Lives Matter movement has mobilized to affect policy change, leaving Latino communities to confront our own anti-Blackness and ask ourselves, what does solidarity look like? The Generation Z has per pushed the needle in creating new language that is more inclusive of gender and ethnicity, words like Latinx that often are polarizing, but in essence, its goal is to challenge the notion that Latinos and Latinas are not a monolith. As an undocumented or DACA recipient, uh, it is my distinct honor to be moderating this conversation. Tonight, we are joined by Latinx icons and luminaries. The folks that you are joining us tonight have carried the torch in their distinct fields and will be providing their insight on how do we keep moving forward. Tonight, it's about taking inventory of where we are as a community and how do we move forward inspiring future leaders. Um, so please help me welcome Presidente Adela de la Torres, President of, uh, of San Diego State University, Sean Elo Rivera, Council Member of San Diego's 9th City Council District, 
Dolores Huerta, founder and president of the Dolores Huerta Foundation, Dr. Nadia Lopez, educational leader, and Huisteca Martinez, co-chair of Earth Guardians, an environmental and social justice organization. Each panelist will have a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and talk about the work they're currently doing. After the introductions, we will dive into a moderate conversation. Then we will open it up to Q&A. If there's a question that you would like to ask, please type it into the chat um, and we will be um, discussing those towards the end. So yes, um, please help me welcome Presidente Adela de la Torre. Hello, and thank you for this wonderful invitation. Um, I am president of San Diego State University. I arrived in 2018 after spending 16 years at UC Davis, uh, six years as the vice chancellor of student affairs and campus diversity. Uh, I also for many years have directed um, Chicano studies departments. I started at California State uh, University in the in the 90s, then went to University of Arizona, oversaw the Mexican American uh, Studies and Research Center, as well as was a director of the Hispanic Center of Excellence, the first one at University of Arizona, and then followed at University of California, Davis, um, where I was the chair for many years of, of the Chicano Latino Studies Department there as well, and then came uh, to become the vice chancellor. One of the, I think, interesting um, aspects of the journey is that um, when I graduated from Berkeley, I was the first Mexican-American woman to get a PhD in agricultural economics in 1982, and subsequently didn't realize in the lonely journey of moving through higher education that I would oftentimes be the first in relationship to creating spaces for my community. I was a founding member of the, of the American Society of Hispanic Economists, the first president, the first uh, Latina. And um, in that journey, recognized that in economics, the, the issue of inclusion and diversity was, and still is a major issue. Um, I think the point here is that uh, I have always been um, very committed um, from the onset to address issues of diversity. I'm very honored to be here with Dolores Huerta because when I was um, in college as well as in high school, I was one of those young members who looked up to Dolores and, and to Cesar for um, you know, the movement and the movement of at the time in the 60s and the 70s um, was the movement of the United Farm Workers. They were the ones who taught us about issues of what a strike and what a boycott and you know, uh, doing the grassroots activism that I think is so critical even today for our community. So to be sharing the podium with such a, a, an incredible leader and visionary Dolores Huerta is a real honor. So thank you. Thank you so much, um, Presidenta de la, la Torre. Next up, we have Sean Elo Rivera, council member of San Diego's Ninth City Council District. Sean. Thank you, Yosemar. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I'm a little, um, definitely humbled and a, a little and a little embarrassed even to be sharing um, the stage, the virtual stage with such um, awesome leaders here. I also wanna say thank you to the student leaders, um, Rebecca, Serena, uh, Nora. You know, I know that you all put in a lot of work to make this happen wrangling speakers like this is not easy. And so I wanna make sure your work is honored as well. Um, so thank you. Um, once again, uh, my name is Sean. I am the council member for San Diego's ninth city council district, um, which includes San Diego State University. Um, and I was elected in November of this past year, swore into office in December. Um, and it's an awesome, awesome job with an, that it provides an incredible opportunity uh, to uh, impact the community hopefully in positive ways. Um, I'll just share a little bit of my story. Um, I will tell you that um, one of the reasons why I'm so uh, humbled and this means so much to participate in this panel is um, because of uh, what it means to me in terms of identity. I'm someone co who comes from a multi-ethnic and multi-religious family who um, my mom was, was um, my mom's parents were both born in Central America. She grew up in the US and in Mexico, but um, because of my mixed identity, uh, my somewhat ambiguous um, uh, 
uh, appearance. Um, I come from a family that's, uh, my dad's Jewish, my mom's Catholic. And so I didn't always feel like I fit into um, spaces or, or I should say would be welcomed into spaces um, where I would uh, feel like I could otherwise identify. So despite feeling very much feeling Latino, I was often um, kind of uh, uncertain or uh, embarrassed to step into those spaces because I wasn't sure how I'd be received. And so this has been a journey for me in terms of um, stepping into those spaces more and more regularly and finding uh, how uh, it's an incredibly meaningful experience for me to step into those spaces, be around the folks who I shared culture and identity with and, and see how much I was embraced. Um, it's, we're about a decade into that now. Um, it's something that I actually um, really got to experience when I was in law school here in San Diego. And so I, I wanted to flag that because um, just it means a lot to me to be here and, and to be welcomed in this space in this way um, for those reasons. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a multi-ethnic, multi-religious home and that very much shaped the way I see the world. Um, everyone is very much like family to me because my family kind of is everyone. Um, I have a Thea who uh, converted to Islam and so I have cousins who wear hijabs and uh, like I said, my dad is Jewish. And so our family has a, a bit of everyone. Uh, we had a very, very much had a, a um, roller coaster ride kind of in and out of the middle class. Um, there were some very rough times. There are some, some really good times. And I think that those experiences really taught me that, um, you know, our economic stability and the capitalist system that the US operates is very fragile. Um, and the quality of human beings that my parents, you know, were did not did not change whether or not my dad was making good money or we were really struggling. Um, they were great people and great parents no matter what, um, but their circumstances might have changed. And so I try to bring that with me um, in the work that I do. Um, I will tell you that my first nine years after high school, I spent as a high school coach. I was a uh, swimming and water polo coach. And uh, I was inspired by the Obama campaign um, to try to do a little bit more and to have a deeper impact. And that eventually led me to law school. Um, while I was in law school, I started doing some work at legal clinics uh, in the community. Realized that the folks who I was seeing on a weekly basis um, despite really being really proud of the work that we were doing and feeling like we were making a difference on a day-to-day -day basis, seeing people who were impacted by the same issues week after week, whether that meant um, housing instability or immigration, um, the justice system, um, more often than not, uh, bad policy was leading folks to be in bad situations you know, over and over again. And so for me, but the way my brain worked, um, I knew that that would feel like a treadmill, a treadmill to me that I, I would only be able to uh, tolerate being on for so long. And so I wanted to get to the root of the issue, which to me, again, was uh, uh, the design, the, the unjust design of systems, um, poor policies, um, and, and wanting to make sure that I, I could make a difference on that front. Um, after law school, I spent a few years at a community-based organization in City Heights, leading organizing civic engagement and policy work there. And for the two years prior to being elected to city council, um, I served as the executive director of an organization called Youth Will, where I worked with young people, mostly 16 to 24, to create policy change that, um, that they dream dreamed up. Um, it was an incredibly inspiring and awesome job. Um, but um, the opportunity to run for city council was an incredible one. I was currently at the time serving as an elected member of the San Diego Community College Board of Trustees. And um, my all of my career choices since that moment when I was inspired by the Obama campaign when I decided to leave coaching has been about trying to create bigger impact. And um, when, I, when I was encouraged to run for city council and thought about the ways that I could directly potentially change the policies that had been impacting the people that I'd aimed to serve almost a decade earlier in a community that I loved um, in City Heights that um, reflected my family um, and its multi-ethnic and multi-religious nature. Um, it seemed like an incredible, incredible chance to, um, to do some good, good work. And so I get to do that now on a daily basis. I have an awesome team around me um, and I feel extremely fortunate to, um, to work with them um, to, to create policy change 
um, to hopefully design better, more just systems. Um, and um, I just really want to say thank you again for uh, inviting me to be here. Um, feels like I'm gonna, you know, not nearly uh, do this thing justice um, having. Uh, uh, Ms. Huerta behind me, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and thank you again. I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you so much, Sean. We're so excited that you're able to join us to give us your insight. Next up, we have um, Dolores Huerta, who will be talking about her work and what she's currently doing. So please welcome Dolores Huerta. The Dolores Huerta. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's been a while since we've all been able to get together and we're hoping now with the pandemic hopefully ending that uh, we will be able to see each other in person, uh, hopefully next year. <clears throat> but uh, the work that we've been doing with the Dolores Huerta Foundation uh, has been uh, you know, doing all of the uh, food banks uh, that we have to do, giving people information about uh, COVID-19 and of course, preparing them uh, for the future. Uh, we have a very uh, strong youth organization and uh, our, our young people have also been uh, participating in many of the food banks that we've been doing and giving out the COVID-19 uh, protection information that they need. Uh, we've also raised money uh, to be able to give, uh, especially our, our documented families that weren't able to get any other kind of relief uh, to be able to give them uh, some, kind of, you know, some kind of financial resources that they need. Uh, we know that right now uh, we have so much work to do. Uh, we also do canvassing, by the way, door to door. We did a lot of work on the census uh, to try to get people to get themselves counted. Uh, did a lot of work on uh, getting uh, getting people out to vote, uh, which we know is very, very important. And uh, we're, we're actually located in uh, four different counties. We're in Kern County. And by the way, it's Kevin McCarthy's district. I think you all know who Kevin McCarthy is. He's the leader of the Republican Party. All of those people who voted against the stimulus package that was just passed uh, were in Fresno County and Tulare County and also part of Los Angeles County. And uh, we have 14 chapters of the, our uh, organization and we call them Vecinos Unidos, United Neighbors. Because this is what we do, we try to teach people how to organize and uh, that they have to know that they have to support each other. That's the only way that we can make things happen. So the people that we organize, they do a lot of uh, work on infrastructure. And in the past, we've been, uh, they've been able to get like neighborhood parks, uh, swimming pools. Uh, one of our committees, uh, they were able to pass a bond issue to get a brand new gymnasium uh, built for their middle school. And basically, uh, and then, of course, we try to get them to run for uh, different offices. And I, I really want to uh, uh, salute Sean because uh, he's uh, showing the way there by being a, a, a city council uh, person, by running for the, that kind of a position. Uh, uh, our folks, they run for, uh, for positions on the school board, the recreation board, uh, the water board. And yes, we encourage them also to run for positions like this, like the city council. And the school boards are very important because as you know, in trying to find the systemic racism that we have, uh, we know that one of the places where a lot of the racism is actually practiced is in our school systems. And we, we sued our local high school uh, because they had expelled 2,000, 2,000 black and brown students. And that was several years ago. And then uh, they had to start training because of the impl implicit bias uh, that exists, that it kind of still kind of exists in uh, the current high school district where they have like uh, the majority of the teachers are Anglo. They have uh, very few teachers. I think like only 18% of the teachers are, are teachers of color. Uh, so we're still in that lawsuit. Uh, we're going back to court on the 26th of, of, of April, actually to see if they have complied. But in terms of, of the expulsions, uh, we that number was reduced from 2000 ex expulsions to 21, okay? So you can see that we have made some progress. And uh, uh, we're active in like 17 different school districts, uh, organizing the parents and the students uh, so that they can give the recommendations uh, to, the, uh, to the school uh, districts of what they need to do uh, uh, to actually improve uh, uh, their educational practices in, in many, many ways, but especially as they affect low income and, and students of color. And one of the other areas that we worked in, they actually, the suspension rate and expulsion rate of black students was 81%. If you can imagine, if you can, eight out of 10 students were being either expelled or suspended. Uh, well, needless to say, we've been able to uh, make some progress there also. And we actually 
had the school district uh, name uh, African American Advisory Committee uh, because so many of the black students were being affected by the discriminatory practices. So basically what we do is empower people and not all of them have, a, have the luxury of having a, a high school education or even a college education. But so what we have to do is instill into them that they have power, even though they do not have an a high school education or a formal education, and that they can actually uh, you know, make the changes in their community, and they do. And of course, we also encourage them to get involved in, in political campaigns, to get out there and get out the vote, uh, register to vote. And so I think the work, I can say that the work that we do is about just empowering people. Because we know if we want to make the changes that we need, that the people have to understand that they are the only ones that can do it, that they have the power to do it. And they don't have to wait for anybody to come and make the changes for them, that they can actually make the changes. And so, uh, and I, I know that all of us are working very hard because uh, we see uh, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel uh, we see there's a new day coming. We know that uh, President Biden and, and his administration just voted to uh, get all these stimulus checks out to people. Oh, by the way, uh, if you haven't heard the good news, Deborah Hallen, who is the first Native American person uh, to be in the president's cabinet, was confirmed today as the head of the Department of Interior. So that is something that we can celebrate and we're looking forward, of course, to many more things, not only that we can celebrate, but things that we can participate in making happen. You know, si se puede, we can, we can do it. Thank you, muchas gracias, Dolores. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have Dr. Nadia Lopez. Um, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, and to be amongst this esteemed panel is really an honor. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I want to thank the student leaders for their dynamic work, um, even opening up this session. But just the acknowledgement for me to be on this panel is really important. There was a time that I wouldn't even be considered part of the conversation um, as an Afro Latina or Latinx um, because. As we know, there is a lot of segregation that happens within our own community. And so growing up as a child of parents who are from Guatemala and Honduras, it's, it's a humbling experience to be here, but to also stand in my truth to say that I'm a representation of how we all are different, right? And we're not a monolithic um, a community. And so my work as a principal um, as a former principal, but the founder of Mott Hall Bridges Academy in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which um, if folks really understand New York City is one of the most segregated um, school systems in the United States. Um, there's not a lot of representation of Afro Latinas or Afro Latinos um, within our communities and we're not often highlighted. And so it's been really important for those young people who have been marginalized, who more than 95% of them live below the poverty level and they represent black and Latino children. Um, as a founder of a school, what I found very interesting is when I opened the school, I remember sitting with a group of Latino children and asking them, who do they admire? And you know, give me the name of the person you admire. So immediately you will always think of your family member first, right? And then secondary, you would say someone who you've seen on TV or, you know, something. And the children could not tell me someone who was of Latino descent that they could admire. And I wondered about the imagery and the lack of representation in the media for those children to see themselves because they were of a darker shade. And so it became part of my mission to make sure that we had representation. Not only was it gonna start with me, but we were gonna have people who looked like them to tell their stories, to tell their journey, but as well to empower the families because what we fail to understand is that the school is a representation of the community. And as Senora Huerta talked about, um, the suspensions that happens in school, it's often because our schools are oppressing our children and not teaching them about who they are, their culture and the contributions that we've made into society, right? They're, everything that we see that is great from art 
to language, to astronomy, science, math, all of those things came from our people, but we're not taught that. And so my work has been to empower children. I feel as adults, we get our degrees, we come together, we have organizations, but it's the young people who are in our schools whose families trust the school system to educate them without knowing that sometimes their very culture is being um, whitewashed or it's disappearing. And so my advocacy is around empowering our young people to have voice, to know that they matter, to know that many of the positions that they have to take on is as a community leader, is understanding the policies that are in place and how they are not for us, but often against us. And then the importance of voting, how they have to show up. So as young as my, my scholars have been in middle school, I know that they're gonna be adults, that they're gonna be 18 years old. And so the work that I do now, as I've transitioned out of my position as principal, one started because of my lack of self-care because we often, because when we're taking care of our community and we're fighting for them, we do it at the expense of ourselves. And so I now support school leaders and those who are aspiring to understand one, the balance between self-care and understanding that resilience does come at a sacrifice, but there are ways that we can preserve ourselves because that's a revolutionary act. I also teach them the importance of creating spaces where our children are safe and surrounded by adults who understand who they are, understand their community and can invest in their values. Um, but I also, as a result of COVID, my, the co-founder of my organization, the Lopez Effect, as well as Elevated, Monique Chu and I have created um, a program called Mind Your Business, which is financial literacy and entrepreneurship. Because what we found is that many of our families weren't able to survive. And thank God we do have stimulus, but that won't always be around. So how do we preserve and teach our young people to start creating their own? How do we in influence them to understand that the skills that they need for presentation, the skills for savings, how all of these things can prepare them for a life of generational wealth, but also to navigate our society. So that's my work and I'm excited to be here and to learn from everybody on the panel as well. Muchas gracias, Dr. Nadia Lopez. Uh, we're so excited to have you here for this conversation. Next up, we have Wisteca Martinez, the co-chair of Earth Guardians, an environmental and social justice organization. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, thank you all for having me. Piali, Kuali, Yowali, good evening, y'all. Nano toka shutes katanatiu, nutsunan pa imboler kolorada al tepet. Iwanin, kalpuli kuailama. Santa Cruz de Calpisca, Xochimilco. Um, my name is Shipteska. I'm an artist, I'm an organizer. I've done a lot of work for a lot of my life with an organization called Earth Guardians. And uh, grateful to be present with y'all tonight. Thank you to, to all the voices and all the incredible work that is being done by the folks on the panel. The youth as well, you know, everyone who helped organize and put this together um, before the virus. You know, I would spend a good amount of my year like traveling to universities and connecting with community, tapping in with local organizers, seeing the work that goes into putting these kinds of events together. Uh, I miss it. I miss a lot of things about it. You know, getting to know the students, like just connecting with community in person. Uh, there's something so special about that. And um, I don't know, I, I, I have, I'm 20 years old and I didn't take the route of going to university. And so that for me was like a really amazing opportunity as uh, somebody who, you know, was able to go and enter these different, you know, university and college environments, um, learning from incredible, you know, storytellers and spokespeople and organizers while bringing and offering what I have to share. Um, and so it's been, yeah, it's been, it's been a long, it's been a long uh, time without, you know, that kind of work. And I think this last year has challenged so many of us to adapt and evolve our understanding of what our relationship to organizing has looked like, what our relationship to our work has looked like. Um, and for me, you know, who has spent a lot of my life as both a hip hop artist um, and a storyteller as well as an organizer in the climate space, um, really diving into what it looks like, you know, both when the world is in a global pandemic, but understanding, I think this, everything from the pandemic to the uprising of our relatives to defend black life across the country and in different parts of the world, 
has continued to underline the necessity of us, um, of our communities, our people to enter these spaces and understand how our struggles are, are deeply intertwined. Um, and as folks are, 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 are mentioning and speaking of, of you know, the, the deep work that needs to be done in Latin and Latinx communities around the anti-Blackness that is so prevalent. Like I see the same thing in many indigenous communities that I operate in and organize and exist within um, the climate movement as a whole as well. You know, I think at its foundation has a lot of uh, roots in, you know, white supremacy. If, if you look back at, you know, the, the beginnings of a lot of um, conservationist organizing and, and ways in which the preservation of, of a pristine environment was used as a, as a way to justify the extermination of indigenous peoples from our lands, from, you know, our traditional home places for, for white settlers to be able to occupy these spaces. And so as we, you know, are continuously um, confronted, you know, with the realities of, of how connected these conversations are, uh, it's evoked a lot of transformation. Um, and one of the most exciting projects that I've been involved in over the last couple of years is, is this Indigenous Youth Leadership Initiative that we began um, kind of underneath the umbrella of the Earth Guardians organization. And in 2019, we began this program with this idea of how do we create and open up spaces for young Indigenous leaders to come to the land, to learn, to sit with elders, to sit with experts, with organizers, with people who have been in the field with street medics to teach and share these kinds of skills. Um, because if we look around like young black and brown people, young indigenous people are at the forefront of, of pushing social and political change everywhere that we look. And when within the climate space, the narrative and the ways in which we elevate certain people is not representative of that. And it's beautiful to open the, this, this conversation with the land acknowledgement you know, of the Kumeyaay Nation, of our relatives um, that who traditionally occupy, you know, a lot of territory in Southern California and Mexico. Um, but I, at the same time, in, in the climate movement, we oftentimes see that as the only step that is taken to really acknowledge Indigenous people. And meanwhile, like the youth are the ones that are out there putting their bodies on the line, that are defending their homelands, who have a very different relationship with land than the climate crisis and, and the, the climate organizing space often offers. For us as indigenous people, our orientation is, is one of survival, of cultural survival. Um, and I think if we, if we take the opportunity to really think about what the climate crisis means for all of our communities, it is one of, of cultural survival for, for us all. Um, and so I think within this work, the last two years have been developing this training program which we, you know, through COVID, we ran on Zoom. We did four weeks um, where we brought a, a handful of different young indigenous leaders together. We brought in different teachers and elders to share this wisdom, to share this story, to hold this space and build a little bit of what became a political home as well, an organizing home for a lot of these young leaders, um, collecting resources and giving grants out to young people to go back and take into the community to do work, whether that was through the lens of food sovereignty, of storytelling, myself as an artist, continuing to see how we can leverage these spaces within culture uh, as artists to continue to push the conversation on how we see how these issues are so connected. And you know, one space that I was really inspired by um, is this, this movement that is, is continued to rise to the surface through all over the world of, of, of land back, of the return of land to indigenous peoples. Um, it's a very complex, you know, political alternative to the world that we exist in right now. And, as we've seen from this pandemic and from, you know, many presidents and many administrations that the US government does not function in a way that actually values our community, our people, our lives, our well-being, that does not invest in infrastructure to protect us when we are experiencing things, whether it's weather events like, you know, the massive storm that happened in Texas or, you know, a pandemic like this. And so when we think about these alternative futures, for us, you know, for within this work at Earth Guardians, a lot of that looks at bringing these resources back to youth and, and eventually, you know, the long vision of this campaign and of this project is to invest in being able to bring up these spaces for, for, for youth of many different kinds of communities to, to do this work. And so that's, that's some of what we've been up to, obviously a lot of voting work um, and myself as an artist as well, leveraging my platform, creating a lot of incredible art that I'm really excited to share over the next couple of months that will continue to push 
the envelope on a lot of these conversations. But 2020 was a huge year of learning, of detachment, of, um, yeah, again, really thinking about and, and looking at what is our relationship to these movements and to these moments that we are in and how can we truly be best of service um, to what the world and what our communities need of us right now. So it's an ongoing process and experience. And again, just honored, grateful uh, to be a part of this, you know, esteemed panel, Plaza Comati, and I'll pass it on to next. Gracias, thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're really excited to have you here. Um, as we uh, get started, well, I think one of the questions that I want to start off with is as you, you know, one of the things that happens with being leaders in your community and having achieved so much, right, um, is oftentimes that people um, think it was just inherent, that just, it just inherently came. But what was, the, I just want to, I'm wondering, what was the catalyst um, that propelled you to harness your power um, and kind of propelled you to be where you're at now and the work that you're currently doing? Um, anybody care to share a little bit about that, your beginnings? Well, I can start, I can just say that uh, I was very fortunate uh, to learn how to organize. And uh, and I, I should change that word. I think the word is how to empower, uh, because this is what we've all been talking about right now. Uh, we, folks, the, the great uh, doctors that we have here today on this panel, they empower people uh, with the education and the things that, that they are teaching people. Uh, so um, our, my task, I believe, and what I have learned is to empower the people that, that as I said before, that don't have a formal education uh, and probably will never be in a position to, to get a formal education, uh, but, but to let them know that they also have power. And the way that we organize them is we get them and we have meetings with them, and, uh, small meetings, uh, family for family, uh, of course, during the pandemic, we haven't been able to do this, but we meet in people's living rooms. <clears throat> and, and then, uh, you know, uh, we get them to commit uh, that they will have other meetings and other meetings and other meetings. Like when we started the United Farm Workers, uh, people uh, probably have heard about the Delano grape strike and all of that that happened. But what the people don't know is that we actually organized for three years, for three years in people's homes until we were able to uh, dis dispel the fear because you know, the one thing that holds people back is because uh, they, number one, they don't feel that they matter, uh, that sometimes they, they, they just lack the courage and there's a lot of apathy in our community and we have to make them understand that, that they have an obligation, that they also have to commit part of their, part of their life, part of their resources uh, to make things better. And the main thing that they have to understand that if they do not do it, it's not gonna happen, that nobody's gonna come in there and improve their lives or improve their community, that they are the ones that have to do it. And once they, once they get that, once we can convince them of that, then the world opens up for them. And once that they exercise their power and they see what they've been able to accomplish, oh my God, it's, it's miraculous, you know? Because then they wanna go on and do more and more and more. So uh, when I first learned of, that you, this is a way that you could actually make change, that you could, you know, fight the establishment, so to speak, I felt like I found a, a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, okay? Because I, like many of you, suffered many discriminations growing up and, and always saw, especially how the, the farm workers were treated and you wondered, what can we do about this, you know? And then once you learned that you can organize and empower people and that they can do it for themselves. And that is the main thing uh, that, that I learned and that I try to teach. Thank you, gracias. I think, you know, uh, I just wanted to dovetail there. There is, I think, an interesting narrative just listening to all the participants is that the, I think there is a really important model here about how we look at Latinx leadership. And, and it's not necessarily captured by an individual narrative, but I think the emphasis is really the fact that when we look at the stories of, the, of, of all of us, it's a story of a community. It's a story of a collective. It's a story about a network of people who are committed in creating social change. And that real intrinsic desire is something that day to day, this is what I'm hearing from every narrative that, that has been shared today. It's a tremendously positive story in the context of despite all of the issues that have been in the past, whether it is um, discrimination and racism that has permeated our society, or more recently, in, you know, when we look at the pandemic and, and the gross inequities, 
we see that this is this is a very important model of leadership in that it really challenges, I would say, the archetypical leader of the great white male. You know, we've just gone through what it means to have a singular leader at um, the, the, the level of the head of, of um, the presidency. What does it mean when our leaders look at singular versus collective leadership? And we're seeing a shift now. And I do think it's important for us to recognize um, that this perspective, this perspective of empowerment, collective leadership, community is really important in terms of the future of leaders, particular the new generation of leaders. And so, you know, I think the message um, that not only um, we've heard from Dolores, but also I think from all, um, from um, Nadia in particular is one in which, um, we're, we're talking about really recognizing the rich cultural capital we have, the navigational capital we have, and the linguistic capital that we have as communities of color and bringing that at the forefront of the discussion in how we navigate spaces, whether it's in, the, um, in terms of global, global environment issues, whether it's in schools, whether it's in dealing with voting rights, and I think this is something that we need to really um, create, if you will, and bring forward. Uh, and I think we're all are saying this in different ways, the assets that are being brought to how we're looking at change and how important it is to begin this trajectory with that perspective of leadership as leaders of color um, and lead through that strength and that collective. Um, because I do think at the end of the day, when we look at the type of change that we're seeing and what we want, we want lasting change. We want it to outlast individuals because there is one certainty. All of us at some point will not be here. That's a fact. But what we want to do is leave a legacy of leadership that, become, that is sustainable, that creates a kind of model for the future that we would like to see. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I'll just jump in really quick. I'll say that, you know, I, I alluded to my, my journey a bit. And I, I think, you know, I, I spent a decent amount of time kind of wondering what, knowing that I wanted to do more, knowing what I wanted to connect more with my, my Latin background, my, my roots all kind of all over the place. And um, for me, in when when the Obama campaign, the reason why that meant a lot to me was because of the identity aspect of that. I grew up in, in Orange County, and um, as soon as I was old enough to have a political identity, I knew I didn't fit in around with the folks around me. We weren't thinking about things in the same way as most of the folks around me were talking about it. And between that and my mixed ethnic and religious background, despite wanting to have certain types of impact in the world, I didn't think that there was a, a place for me to do that. And so seeing someone with um, then Senator Obama's background and the way he was talking about the world was very important to me and it made me want to step one step further. And that, um, that was important to me because it began a journey that um, uh, Ms. Huerta was talking about that we've heard a lot about, which is about kind of understanding and recognizing power and opportunities to create change. And so, you know, each step for me has been an important part, uh, an important journey in understanding what my role can be in helping make the world look a little more like I'd like it to look, which is, I think, uh, the slogan that we've used when I run for office is opportunity for all. And the time that I've spent working with young people um, as a coach and, and, and as an organizer, as a teacher, um, makes me have an incredible amount of, of um, passion for and belief in the potential of all people, uh, particularly young people. And so it's wanting to create a world where everyone has a chance to tap into their potential and reach that potential. And as I've kind of taken one step after another, you know, it's recognizing what my abilities are, um, where, where I have, um, how I can use, use my privileges, 
how I can use the different access that I've gained when I got my law degree um, to step into certain rooms and be able to say certain things. Um, and, and so each step along the way has encouraged me to do a little bit more because I think that um, in doing so, the hope is, is that um, to President De La Torre's uh, point, is that we can create a, a different system where there, there are more people who have access to create change. Um, and so it, in my role as a council member now, I, we often talk about breaking down the walls of city hall, right? So, and challenging every assumption, right? Why does the voting age have to be 18? Why can't folks who are undocumented, uh, why can't they vote, right? So we're gonna ask, we're gonna challenge assumptions. We're gonna challenge uh, uh, the, the ways that things are usually done um, because that's a skill that I've realized that I'm fairly comfortable with. Um, I can get myself into a space um, I can use the education I've got or the ability to run a campaign to get in a room and ask questions um, and, and challenge the status quo um, with the hopes that um, more people in general, but especially young people, um, will have a role in, in, in creating their version of the reality that they'd like to see. And, and, and I'll just close by saying this. I try to, as often as possible, go back to my organizing background, right? And the definition that we use of power which is the ability to act or control circumstances, right? And so what I wanna see is community in general, young people in particular have more power because as we've heard from the young folks who have spoken here today, um, I trust your vision of the world much more generally than I do um, folks who get more older and jaded. And while there's wisdom um, for sure and those who've kind of um, been through the battles and, and wear the scars of, of, of fighting the fight, um, young people's wisdom to me is the, the ability to see a better and, and, and more just a, a better world. Um, and so I want young people to have power. And that's so for me, Yosemar, it's about um, kind of one step after another, realizing that if I can I kind of take a step into a new space, there might be a, an ability for me to either knock down a wall or bring a new chair to the table to create the spaces where young folks in particular, but more people in general in the community have more power. Thank you. Anybody else? I wanted to just add and say, when you asked about the part about where, this, where does our superpowers come from? So first for me, it would be my parents. Um, they were very intentional about what schools I would attend. Um, because my dad had a ninth grade education and my mom had a sixth grade education, you know, back home, you going to school that, that long in life for them, you learned a lot as opposed to here in the States, you don't learn nearly as much, but they understood the power of education and the wealth for them. Like they didn't have the money, but they understood that knowledge was the equivalent of wealth because as long as you went to school and you got degrees or at least you learned a trade, that could actually bring something of substance to you in your life. Um, but my parents, because they were from Guate and Honduras, they didn't, they weren't familiar. My mom, not so much. My dad read a lot and he watched a lot of uh, US commentary. My mom was really she knew her history from Guate, but she wasn't familiar with like civil rights. She understood, but she came here after 1969, um, 1970. So they relied on me learning through books. They relied on me putting me in specific schools. Like my, my father said to me, you know, Miha, you're, you're going to be you're going to be seen as a black child in the United States of America. And the experiences of what people have gone through here is different from what we've experienced back home. And so you need to really truly understand it. So the first school that they put me in was a school like a freedom school where we learned specifically about um, black history and what that meant to be black in America. But they still kept me grounded in my culture. So every year we went to Guatemala, like, you know, every to see Abuela and the whole family, right? And all of those things. And I saw poverty from a different landscape than what I see poverty here in the United States. 
And so the superpower started with my parents because they made it very much so a priority that I understood what my culture and ethnicity was, but what my reality was going to be here in the United States. And then further, um, when I became an educator, I realized that there were children who were gonna have the same experience, but many of their parents didn't have the language. They didn't have the access. Um, you know, I had New York Times, National Geographic in my household. The kids that I serve in Brownsville don't have the access to any of those things. And so it made it very much important that I had to take on the role that my parents did for me for those young people to provide them with that information because I feel like the only way my superpowers are activated is if I make sure children are liberated. If I make sure that children are equipped with what they have to do to be successful, that I make sure that they know the language to advocate for themselves because for the most part, I'm the one who got myself into college. I'm the one who filled out all of the forms, all of these things that we're taught, especially as first generation children, because our parents don't have that capacity. So the superpowers lie within my parents and then the children that I've been able to serve. Gracias. Next. Well, uh, I, I can just step in for a second. I, I think one of the things that's happening, first of all, we all know that we're, uh, I think that we're uh, coming out of this uh, pandemic, we're coming out of the Trump administration. It's, uh, it's, like, uh, it's like we're like the butterflies that are coming out of the cocoon, you know? And, and, and we do see a, a light at the end of the tunnel. And some of the things that we've been talking about are things that we have to uh, make sure that they are included in our educational system. Uh, we do know that uh, the ethnic studies, for instance, that uh, the governor, Governor Newsom has uh, put money into the state budget that there will be money for high schools uh, that they will, for them to be able to teach ethnic studies. Uh, Jose Medina, who is a, uh, one of our state legislators, uh, he is, has a bill that, uh, that ethnic studies has to be a high school re requirement before you can graduate from high school. But we know that we've got to get that down into kindergarten and the elementary schools because we, we don't want to grow any more racist or, you know, or not neo-Nazis, et cetera. Uh, you know, we want to make sure because we know that a lot of the racism that exists and that we've all suffered, uh, it really comes for ignorance. And so one way that we can erase the ignorance is to make sure that uh, ethnic studies are included in kindergarten and not only ethnic studies, but we have to have gender studies also. So, because we know that the misogyny and sexism against women uh, continues, you know, the machismo continues. And, uh, and also that uh, children can be taught, yeah, that there is a third gender. There is a third gender. And so we can uh, do a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, do away with a, a, lot, a lot of the isms that exist in our society. Uh, but also, we should also include civic education uh, because right now, uh, when we think, and we know, I'm sure we all know people that didn't vote or they voted the wrong way, whatever. And, and uh, young people are not being taught that it is a responsibility in the civic duty uh, to be able to vote. We have so many Latinos, as we know, that are eligible uh, to become citizens and they haven't become citizens. We have a lot of Latinos uh, who are not registered to vote. We have a lot of them that are registered to vote, but they don't vote. And when we think of our population and the power that we have in our population just by the numbers, and yet our folks are not participating. And the other thing too that we have to think about when we talk about racism is that we know that it exists in our own community and uh, that we have the colonization mentality and a lot of our folks, they have to understand that the racism that, that exists, that is such a part of, of the society here in the United States and, and also in the Latin American countries, uh, we know that that exists there also, that it all comes from slavery. Uh, when uh, people, uh, slaves were expe expected to give their energy and their work for free. And then, of course, the indigenous people uh, were uh, here in the United States were the first slaves, of course, in the Latin American countries also. So well, part of our work that we have to do, I think we're like missionaries. And like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, racism is a sickness, okay? So then we have to look at ourselves as the missionaries that are going out there 
to, to cure the, the sickness and to erase the ignorance that exists in, in people's minds uh, so that we could really see, uh, as Doc, again, as Dr. King said, that we could have a beloved community eventually. And one thing, I think when we talk about the indigenous folks, and I'm so happy to see that we started uh, this event today uh, with uh, the blessing of indigenous people, is that these are the values that we want to promote. You know, the values of sharing, of protecting each other, you know, and, and, and the respect. And, and, you know, if we were all together, I would ask you all to hold hands and turn to one another and say, hello, relative. Hello, relative. Because if we can always remember that we are all rely, related, that we are one human race, uh, that will go a long way in, in terms of uh, ending uh, the this hierarchical, hierarchical system that exists right now, uh, the caste system that exists in our society. But the one thing that we do have to be uh, certain is that we all have to step in and and if we wanna see a, a new society that we are the ones, and by the way, all the young folk out here that are listening with us today, you are the ones that are gonna make it happen, as was said earlier. Gracias, thank you so much, Dolores. Uh, we stick out what you like to, um talk a little bit more about how you harnessed your power or what propelled you to do the work that you're currently doing in your community? Sure thing. Yeah, no, I just appreciate listening to what everyone has to offer around this. Um, I think my pops is from Xochimilco, from a town called Santa Cruz, Calpishka. And um, I, I think a lot, I owe a lot of how I, how I view things and how I, you know, see my own relationship to this work, to how I was raised. Um, and I'm, I'm blessed. Like, I'm really, really lucky to have grown up with our culture, you know, my, my great grandmother, um, she was the last kind of generation that grew up speaking Nahuatl, that grew up, you know, a carrier of the language um, before it was, you know, the indigenous people in Mexico, you know, there's a lot of anti-indigenousness to this day, you know, at her time, especially a lot of punishment and, and mistreatment for speaking your language. And so, you know, my, my pops and my grandfather did a lot of work to reclaim our, our ways, our ceremonies. Um, and so I, I think being being brought up, you know, with this very powerful spirit of, of this celebration of life, you know, was, was really important for my work in the climate space. Um, and I think, you know, again, it's, it's this orientation. And, and I think um, uh, the Lord has spoke to this a little bit of, of relationality, you know, of like understanding our relationship to one another, to seeing each other as relatives. I think that same way of, of, of that same perspective really is important to be grounded in when we think about environmental issues. And I think it's such a white space oftentimes when we look at the climate and environmental justice organizing space because um, it's, view, it's viewed from like a, a standpoint of, of science and resources and not from human relations. You know, and how we relate to one another, how we relate to the land. We are people of the land. You know, we are people of the corn, of the water. Like, you know, and, and we are all from many different places. Our backgrounds are diverse, but like, I think fundamentally, these teachings of our, they grounded me. You know, in my culture, in my own identity as a Mexica person. You know, really help like lay the groundwork for me to see myself in, in context to you know, what we do when we, we talk about environmental issues, those are community issues. Um, and I think, yeah, so that was that was very helpful and very important. And I continue to dive deeper into my own ancestry, learning my language right now. Like there's a lot of, as that work continues and, and to remind other folks too, to, to look deeper into where we are from or who we are, um, to hold on to these truths, you know, that are so powerful and that can help guide us forward and, and if we look at how we can care for one another, you know, I think we saw powerful mutual aid uh, in communities over the last year. And, and in a way that the government couldn't take care of us, we were caring for each other. Uh, those are models of, of what our political reality can look like, one that is really centered on community and on caring for one another. And I think, you know, I'm beginning and continuing to see those connections between my community, my family back home in Mexico, the ways that I was raised and, and grounding me in a lot of this, you know, from a, from a very like community oriented perspective rather than just from science and sustainability and um, but really like how do we actually ensure that an economic transition away from fossil fuels to help stop the climate crisis puts our communities at the forefront of, of the benefits of building you know a green economy of ensuring that we have access to jobs to healthcare uh, pathways to citizenship you know these these colonial constructs of borders you know like that is a very violent institution that's a very violent, you know, 
uh, like imaginative, imaginary um, thing that has caused a lot of harm for, for many communities for lots of generations. And so as we move into this, this space of imagining new futures, you know, um, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to have that grounding in my culture. Gracias, thank you. Um, my next question for all of you is, um, being that the last election, we're just coming out of a presidency, right? The vilified immigrants, vilified a lot of um, minorities and, and, and just people of color communities, right? But as we were witnessing the elections, I think there was a really wake up call to folks that do define it as Latinos, because we're also witnessing the way that certain communities based on geographical locations are voting, right? Um, and as the as you are doing the work within your community, what was surprising, what is a surprising obstacle that you face within your own Latinx Latino community that is surprising to you? Um, if you can elaborate on that, on what is the obstacle that, you know, that is surprisingly that you didn't think you would face? Because oftentimes you think, you know, we're all one community, we have similar backgrounds, but the reality is that we all have different priorities or agendas based on our own background, historical, where we come from. So yeah, if anybody can elaborate on an uh, obstacle within your own community that you find surprising. Well, uh, <clears throat> I can go first on that one. Um, I think that one of the things that we have to acknowledge in our community, we have a lot of people that are religious and they're Catholics or they belong to the evangelical uh, religions. And uh, we know that they are voting the wrong way, that they're voting against their own self-interest on the issues of reproductive rights for women. Uh, I know on election day, we were uh, down there at the courthouse, uh, you know, helping people, uh, you know, if they needed any help to vote. And so there was one woman, an immigrant woman, and she was really excited, but she was really scared because it was the first time she ever voted. So I asked one of our staff to, to help her vote. And, uh, you know, and so then when she came back, she said, oh, I helped her, but she voted for Trump. <laughs> and I said, oh, why? She said, because of abortion. Okay, so in our in our community, we still have a lot of people that vote against their self interest because on the issue of abortion, on um, and on the issue of gay marriage, you know. So we have a lot of work to do, and with our families, and and what I like to say to folks: bring bring up the conversation, initiate the conversation with your family, and and talk about the human rights of LGBTQ community. And what I like to do is I like to quote Benito Juarez, the great president of Mexico. And Benito Juarez said, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz, respecting other people's rights is peace. I, as a Catholic woman, as many of you may know, have 11 children. <laughs> My daughter Juanita, uh, who is part of the LGBT community, um, doesn't have any children because she loves dogs, okay? She loves dogs. And so this is what we have to really bring up that conversation uh, to educate our families and our friends and dispel this. And also, you know, religion and politics are two separate things and people should never let any religion inform them of, on how to vote. And so uh, th this is a work that we have to do. We shouldn't wait and say that somebody else has to do this. We have to take this on. And I mentioned before about the fact that people don't think they're important. They think their vote doesn't matter. But this is our work right now. We are working uh, to make sure that democracy works and to get a progressive people like Dr. Rivera <laughs> elected. You know, this is the work that we have to do. And so I also want to say to everybody, uh, you know, we have campaigns coming up. We have a recall campaign coming up against uh, Governor Newsom. Uh, you have some election campaigns going on down there in the San Diego area that I'm aware of. So uh, please uh, volunteer to work in a campaign because this is a way that we learn, learn politics from, from the bottom up. I call it organizing 101, going door to door canvassing or phone banking to get people to vote. And right now uh, we are needed. If, if we want to see these, the, if we want to meet the challenges that we've been talking about, if we want to see this new vision, this new world, we are the ones, as I said before, that have to make it happen, but we have to make it happen by being on the ground and by doing the work that needs to be done to make democracy work. You know, I, I'd like to follow up. I think Dolores hit it right on the nose relative to 
it's not so much of a surprise. And I think Dolores, you'd say the same. There is tremendous diversity within the, the Latinx community. And that's a given. And that is, there is a spectrum of political beliefs that as we know from the last election, there were a, a sizable number, particularly Latino men who also voted, voted for Trump. In fact, if you look at the data out of Texas, but even if you look in the Central Valley, when you look at, you know, some of the elected officials, um, we have clear, you know, uh, perspectives that would reflect the the spectrum that we've seen in the uh, in the election. So, it is incumbent, in if you really want to be responsible, is to ensure that we create opportunities for education and civic engagement. In other words. Um, it isn't about a partisan approach. I think what we have to do is recognize that what we're looking for is um, coming back to a common dialogue of what are really the, the, the values that are important for the community, what are the issues that are important for the community. When I was in Arizona, so I've lived in Arizona, in the Tucson area, um, where um, Senator McCain was extremely popular with the Latino community in South Texas. And at the end of the day, one of my dear friends was part of the um, part of his group. And um, basically she would say, you know, he addresses the local issues effectively. If people have, you know, garbage or alleys that are dirty in their backyard and somebody who's elected isn't responsive, it's going to create a problem, but if you're responsive to those local issues, it goes back to, I think, what, what um, uh, you know, what Dolores was saying, local politics. So what Sean is doing at the local level is critical. If, if you don't answer the constituent day-to-day -day issues of working people, you're not going to get support in a, in a political election because they're living within their communities. So I wouldn't say it's necessarily a surprise. I think it speaks to the work that we need to, to do and goes back to what Dolores is saying. It's really up to us to educate, to create those relations and understanding and, and have robust discussion about these issues as a community. Not with pointing fingers, not with creating hierarchy and not with saying that one group uh, of, or is, is better than another. I think this is something that we should take away from the last election, and I think where we want to move even as a country, and that is creating the types of relationships where you can have robust discussion, where you don't demonize people, and where you create the opportunities for real, um, uh, you know, allies and partnerships. Thank you. Sean, Dr. Nadia. I, um, I can't say that I was surprised. I, I wanna say that I was disappointed and disheartened by the lack of regard for human life and trauma that the previous administration had inflicted on people of color, um, especially people of, um, from Latin America, from those from Central America, right? Like, so for me, the images of seeing what mass incarceration now looks like through an immigration lens, right? The seeing people trying to flee from what, for to gain asylum and having them be turned around and be spoken about as you know thieves and rapists and all of these things. And so I've, I, I couldn't understand how people have disconnected from that. It became like, that's not me, that's them, right? Because it, th whether it's economically, they live a better life than those who are experiencing these traumas or their own personal agenda that's rooted in selfishness, right? Like for many people, when they make it and making it is a title, it's, it's money, it's the power that comes with that, they connect themselves with those who represent those things. So I found it kind of hard to even understand. And some, I literally watched some of the commentary of seeing people just 
how they were able to explain something that was inexplainable for their own personal sake and be okay with it, right? Because I felt like, don't you understand if they do it to this person, they'll do it to you. It doesn't matter. Your last name is the same. The way you look is the same. It's just, you know, you have a little bit of privilege right now, but privileges can be taken away when you're not white. <laughs> and I don't know if they understood that. And so, yes, I think that for it's important to engage in civics. One of the things that we did in the school was I, I, I told the social studies teacher going into the 2015, 2016 school year that it was going to be important for him to redo the entire social studies curriculum. I thought it, we didn't need to focus so much on the chronological learnings of, of history. We needed to focus on the events and themes that happen and embedded in having children really ask the questions of the why behind what's happening and who's responsible. Um, and in doing so, our children were actually prepared. They weren't happy when Trump actually won, but they were better prepared because they already saw what was happening, the social media, the propaganda, the how people were already speaking and, and siding with him. And that was me going against the education in New York City Public School and what New York State said, this is the way education is supposed to be taught. I said, that's not creating civic in, civically engaged children. That's not allowing them to become human beings who can critically think. We're putting them in a school system and forcing them to think the way we want them to so they can become robotic. And so um, I think education has a lot to do with it, but even though there was a high population of um, Latino males who voted for him, there were a lot of Latina females who were out there for him as well. And I was just like, the misogyny, I don't understand. Like, I, I don't get it. But, you know, I hope that with Biden, um, that we will see transformation happen but we know that when Obama was in, in the in the office, it brought out the worst in people. So I just, you know, brace myself for that and hope that as a community we find commonality in humanity so that we could prevail as a people. Thank you. Um Sean Usteka. Um yeah, I'll just the things that kind of jumped into my mind and heart when you asked that question, um, two things immediately came to mind, I guess, from within, within our community. Um, one is the way that um, I, I had mentioned at the beginning, you know, my kind of journey with respect to identity, right? And feeling like I could step into spaces and into Latinx spaces. Um, and as I've kind of um, moved along in my career, um, seeing folks try to erase either my identity um, or challenge um, how Latino I actually am because of my educational attainment. I think that that part, I think the first couple of times I heard that, I'm not sure I was fully ready for that. Um, uh, because there, folks are saying things that if said by someone else outside of our community would be blatantly racist, right? Um, so why can't, because I have a JD, I can't be Latino? I mean, come on, um, what, are we, what are we doing there? And um, so that stung because of the, 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 you know, my insecurities around identity, but I think that one of the things that I've really benefited from is uh, I've been able to go through some leadership development programs and they talk to us about, they, they try to, to ready us for that, for stepping into the arena to like, to, to and, and projection is a real thing, right? And so you see folks throw their insecurities at you, right? Um, uh, because, you know, insecurity is not a fun thing to, to, to wrestle with. And um, so often um, we've been taught to, to believe that there's a, 
there's a scarcity model, right? That there's only so much to go around, whether that means success or power or money, whatever it may be. And the only way um, for one person to succeed is if someone else fails. And so as we attempt to, to you know, climb our way um, uh, to, to succeed, um, whatever that may mean for us, um, other folks may see that as a challenge to their, to their ability to do well. And so the shots that come from, you know, I'm, I'm expecting it from people who oppose my, my um, political agenda. What I was not necessarily braced for um, initially was for it to come from folks who purportedly shared the same political beliefs, who I shared community with. Um, that was, uh, you know, that's, it's done. It's done. And then I, I think the last, the, the other thing that just jumped into my mind when you asked the question was um, when I've spoken up about anti-blackness in, in the Latinx community and, and the, the kind of bending um, into the twisting into knots that I've seen folks do within the, the Latinx community to either try to explain away that or not confront it. Um, or then challenge my identity, like my, so. You know, am I Latino enough to to to, to challenge anti-blackness in the Latino community? Um, I think that's another thing that was like, um, it's surprising, like startling. I think is is you know, it's a little bit different, right? It's like, and especially last summer, right? Like right now, you like that's like that's the battle you want to have right now. Um, it's over that. Um, I think those are two things that jump out, and you know, again, I just. Um, keeping the eye on the prize, right? What are we actually trying to do? What are, what are the actual goals here um, have been important for me to, uh, I'm not gonna pretend like it doesn't sting, right? But to just remember where it's coming from, uh, that we're part of an oppressive system. Um, and, and, you know, through, you know, family and friends, um, we build up um, our mechanisms for, for dealing with these things so we can continue to just take one step after another in pursuit of the bigger goals. Thank you. Tristeka? Uh, yeah, no, no I, I mean, I think there are a handful of different of things come to mind. Um, and obviously the challenges, you know, existing within our own community I think, you know, I was very far from home for the duration of the pandemic too. So like that, that community, you know, the place where I usually gather or have ceremony or like I'm with my family was distant, but from afar, you could still see like our Calpulli, our community in Colorado, um, having meetings around like anti-blackness and about white supremacy within our communities too. And I was encouraged to see that too, because, you know, my pops helps kind of organize some of the community there and it wasn't you know, oftentimes I have to push them on these kinds of conversations or my mom, like have to push them on these kind of stuff to like check themselves. Um, and it was cool to see that it was very apparent, you know, broadly that these were conversations and things we needed to confront that we should have done been confronting for a long time that like really rose to the surface. And so it was encouraging to see folks, you know, in ceremonial circles in, you know, Mexica community also having these similar conversations and also looking at how do we, how do we show up in solidarity? How do we recognize the struggle of our black kin as our own, you know, and 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 fight for them in the way that we will hope that our relatives will stand with us and stand for us. Um, and I just on the flip side of that, as far as the powerful, like the beautiful things that I saw throughout the summer was how this wave of us challenging and, and battling white supremacy really emerged for, you know, a lot of victories in a lot of spaces, you know, and, and indigenous organizing in those communities as well around, you know, tearing down racist imagery and statues to um, removing racist mascots from like professional football teams. Those are campaigns that our community have been like fighting for for many, many, many years that, you know, we're starting to see fruition because there is like this collective awakening and awareness and I think a great deal of solidarity. And so as Land Back continues to expand as a framework for indigenous liberation, you know, it's so imperative that we really hold true to our commitment to Black liberation as a part of Land Back, um, you know, reparations for our Black kin as a part of, you know, Land Back. And I think, um, so I don't know, there was a lot of beautiful things as well that we lifted each other's struggles up, you know, here in Portland, there was a bunch of, where I'm living now, like, throughout the protests, like right now, folks are out there every single day shutting down, 
and protesting to 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 defund line three, which is a which is a pipeline in Minnesota that is, you know, being being built on indigenous territory without consent. Um, and just like throughout the whole summer, those same folks, indigenous folks who were showing up for these Black Lives Matter protests, now it's the other way around and like communities coming together to stand up for one another. And so the challenge is I'm hearing it in everybody's stories and at the same time, like the, the, the power of what happens when we overcome those challenges and those differences that we oftentimes are, are, are tricked into, you know, holding on to these ideas that aren't actually us, like our communities don't actually benefit from this kind of separateness. Um, so I saw both things this summer um, and over the last year, and I'm excited to see how we how we work in, in, a, in a direction that really acknowledges the importance of our liberation being very bound together in order to achieve something that really works for, for all of our communities, for all of our people, for all working people, poor black, brown and indigenous people um, and uplifts all of our relatives. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Nadia Lopez, being that you work in the educational sector and you are focused on opening schools to close prisons. And I, one of the things that I think that comes to mind for me is that oftentimes there's this idea that because you are Latino, you're inherently an immigrant when actually research shows that most Latinos are US born, right? And how can we combat or build the self-esteem of students that might feel that they don't belong or end up giving up or to not pursue higher education? What can we do to instill the values of education within the within that community and to build esteem? And oftentimes these students are in poor communities and urban communities. How can we kind of shift that mentality of like imp the imposter syndrome that oftentimes you, you get as a cost of all the media or all the conversations that you have that we have regarding our identity? For me, leadership matters, right? Leadership actually is what sets the tone, builds the culture, sets the expectations of what um, any institution will follow. And those who are like the subordinates, all of the teachers, professors, whoever. Um, when I created my hall, I can't even begin to just describe the helplessness and the hopelessness that existed in that community. Um, being born and raised in Brooklyn, Brownsville is just not a place you go to unless you are connected to a family member and you have a reason to be there, but you don't just say, oh, I'm gonna go to Brownsville to hang out. No, no, that's not, that's not how it works um, because they have been so disenfranchised. And so they walk in, children walk into spaces already coming broken, right? And a lot of that is, is intentional. It's intentional because of the lack of employment that may be happening in their households or the parents are, are making below um, what the average wage should be. Um, lack of education that's in the household. Um, lack of access, lack of opportunity. There's just so much lack that happens. And so when I created the school, my vision was, yes, to open a school to close the prison, but I had to unpack what that meant because you can make that into a phrase, but what does that really mean? And then also I had to draw a picture of a child graduating and what does that mean for a child who comes into my school? What do they need to leave with and what are the adults responsible for? And by creating that list, part of it was how do they show up into the school? Because that oftentimes what we believe is that because we're the adults or we're the people in leadership, that we are the answer. No, the people who live in the community are the answer. We need to listen. We need to understand who they are. We need to understand their culture. We need to understand their traumas. We need to understand what they lack. We need to understand what our resources are, what are the resources that are in the community. And so it's it's multi-layered. Okay. So when I How when I I've got unstable connection. How is the hotspot supposed to help you? So when I opened the school, I, I had to I literally it. figure uh, out um, what, how do the children show up in the school? So what are the reflection of them in the building? Whether it's photos, whether it's words, so I call them scholars. I didn't call them students because I wanted them to know that they were lifelong learners. 
we had multicultural feasts. We didn't do Thanksgiving because I believe that we need to acknowledge the fact that Thanksgiving is rooted in 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 the destruction of Native Americans in this country. So how do we celebrate our cultures? How do we make sure that children who aren't often seen are seen? How do we bring their families into the school as well? Um, I brought out an or outside organization partners into the school. Um, there is an organization called um, Proud to be Latina. When I said I need representation and I need the children to have access outside of their immediate community, they their organization is connected to um, Wall Street and taking the children to the SP 500 and being able to actually see what that work looked like and look at people who look like them. That was amazing, right? And so when you start to teach them their history, you start to show them places that they can go, you pull them up to the seat and remind them of who they can be and you hold other people accountable to understand that the school is an anchor of the community. And it can't be done alone with just the adults who are in the, in, in, within the school. The children then develop this confidence of knowing someone is invested in them. They understand that there are people who are willing to champion for their success. They understand that there are places that they deserve to be. And so it be, also becomes an example for them that when they become of age and they are in a position of responsibility, they could do that for the next generation. So for me, creating the school was an oasis, but it was also about saying these children are equally as important as the adults who come here every single day. So on the walls, it was, we, we do a lot of artwork. The children did paintings of various artists or various cultural um, pieces that was up on the wall so that they could be celebrated. Um, you know, we made sure that the families, there was translators to speak their natural language as well, right? Because that's the other thing. If, if someone at home doesn't speak the language, then the children are literally raising themselves because there's no support. But for young people, if they do not feel like people are invested in them and we keep talking at them and we create policies that we feel is in their best interest, it's the most simplest thing to say to a child. One, how are you doing today? What do you like about the school? What are the things that I can improve to make sure that this is the best experience for you? And do you feel like you're safe and reflective? Those four questions a child can answer with authenticity. And some of it is so honest that you have no choice but to be taken aback. But when we do that, we are now holding ourselves accountable to be in service, not, not putting ourselves in a position that the children are of service to us, because that's not how it works. We are in service to them and ensuring their success for the future. Thank you. Um, as we're getting close to opening up for question and answer, if you do have a question, you can submit it into the chat um, and we will get into that in a second. Um, my question as we're gearing into that, what is your vision for uh, as we move forward in the work that you're doing in the sector that you're doing? What is your vision and what you, would you like to see manifest? Well, I guess I could start. Um, or Dolores, if you want. No, so, so, gracias. So one of the things I think we need to understand that has been the cataclysmic uh, effect of the pandemic. The pandemic itself has really uh, shifted, if you will, in higher education, its direction in ways that we could never have imagined just a year ago. And what I'm saying about this is that just as we've seen the gross inequities in terms of, of um, you know, the impact in terms of mortality and morbidity with the pandemic uh, in communities of color, what we're also seeing is the fact that um, we, we have also seen these inequities even exacerbated in education, but particularly in higher education from this event. So as we move forward, everything is changing in colleges and universities. 
everything is being reimagined and realigned in terms of perspectives of how we deliver education. In fact, if you were to ask students today, you know, we talked about the digital divide theoretically, but the digital divide became really prominent um, in how we were going to deliver to our students. And remember our students in universities are young adults who are equipping themselves in order to create the transformative change of the future and have a pathway, um, a tremendous idea of a pathway. And sometimes even when they don't are expecting the kind of support structures that generations before had. So I think that what we're seeing in the future, at least in higher ed, is that universities have to demonstrate even greater agility and responsiveness to local and, and global cha challenges in a way that we can really be impactful in creating the types of educational systems that will meet the students where they are, as opposed to how oftentimes we used to look at it is they would come to us. It means that our students can be anywhere at any moment in time and we have to be present for them in those spaces. So we need to, to become really aware of the fact that we are going to have to change how we're designed to serve our students. Um, what's really been, I think, prominent in terms of our communities of color and our underserved is that the reality of the digital revolution now has to be um, accelerated in how we provide those technologies to the community, because even post pandemic, we're going to find our students will want to look at a hybrid world. They, they'll want to have the flexibility of being anywhere in any space and be able to access information. And it has to be affordable. Again, access is not simply an issue of walking in the door. It has to be within the constructs of communities where the issue of debt, even the issue of acquisition of debt is something that is difficult within the context of how they view their commitments to their communities and to their families. So we're gonna really need to have to work in these areas to address this new um, community expectation, um, which we have to serve um, with our futures. And the student experience, I think really needs to be retooled in, in ways where we look at not just the curricular, but the co-curricular. And again, this is an opportunity, I think, when we look about um, creating civic engagement, creating the integration within communities, working in the, the political environment. Um, we at San Diego State, I think, are well positioned precisely because we're in the border region where we can, we can work in multiple um, areas, if you will, both in the US and in Mexico and create these kinds of transdisciplinary research opportunities, engage students in institutional decision making, um, really propel diversity initiatives and sustainability efforts. You know, we have a strategic plan in which we're focusing in many of these areas, but I do think the overlay of the pandemic has forced us to embrace in rapid fire areas where these inequities are even greater and we have a more uh, even a higher responsibility to to work with our students to create the kinds of um, programs that enhance the global principles of social responsibility and justice um, so i i do see a very uh, a new direction for higher education in general because of what we've lived this last year it has completely transformed, I think, many areas and directions. Thank you. Anybody else? Dolores? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, thank you, Dada Torre. I, th I think one of the things I think when we saw students uh, marching and protesting, we know that a lot of students got involved in the last two elections. And what they were asking for is something that this country uh, has been, you might say, delinquent. Uh, and, and not giving the young people what they're asking for. They're asking for free college education, okay? Free college education. And there's no reason why the richest country in the world, the United States of America, has, has not been able to give that to students. And I, I am saying that that's one thing that we have to continue uh, to campaign for and to make it happen. There is no reason why students, when they graduate from college, are burdened with debt 
uh, to make the bankers richer. You know, this income inequality has got to be erased and we have to have free college education. We have to have free health care for everyone like they do in Europe and like they have in Latin American countries, including Cuba. And, and I really encourage uh, every, anybody that can please go to Cuba. Uh, hopefully now with the Biden administration, they will uh, lift the restrictions on going to Cuba. So we can see the system that they have there where people have culture but they also have free education and free healthcare. And there's no reason why we can't have that in the United States of America. So as we're talking about, we're on the cusp right now of, of really great changes that can happen in our United States of America. But as we've said before, we've all got to become really actively engaged. And I just want to really promote some of the legislation that we're going to need your help on. You know, the, the voting rights bill that is now going to the Senate because so many, and when we think about California, we're, we're very lucky. We have two great senators, uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Alex Padilla, uh, now in the Senate, they're gonna vote the right way, but we might have relatives in other places. So when we think about the work that we're doing, think about Texas, okay? Think about Texas and the fact that people there, uh, are, right now they're passing laws that will make it harder for them to vote. So we have this uh, bill uh, that will really make it impossible for all of these states to do these, uh, to pass these laws on voter suppression. Uh, another uh, great law that we, I want everybody to support is Equal Rights Amendment for Women. You probably think, oh, but we already have that. No, we don't, okay? Uh, we are one of the few countries in the world that have not ratified the, the convention, as they call it in the United Nations, the, to pass a law that women and men have equal rights. That is also going to be voted on in the US Senate. And they've got to change the timeline on that one uh, because when Virginia became the 38th state to vote for the Equal Rights Amendment, now it, there's a possibility that we, we can make it happen. And the next one, I don't know that I, I, I know I don't have to ask you to, uh, to work on this because it's immigration reform. <laughs> you know, we, the, the last bill that we had uh, that gave amnesty to folks was in 1986. So now we have to step it up. And, but again, we're going to have to do a massive, massive effort uh, to get these uh, laws passed in the Senate. And just one more thing, you know, when we talk about the refugees and now in the news today, there's all these children at the, at the border, unaccompanied minors, but we have to go a little bit further than immigration reform. We've got to start saying to the people that represent us in the Congress, we have got to stop the exploitation of the Latin American countries, especially Central America. And I always like to use the word bananas, okay? Think of all of the bananas that we buy for, that we eat every single day, but the money that we spend for all those bananas, it doesn't go to the people in Guatemala or Honduras. It goes to Chiquita Banana, Doe Banana. These banana companies, you know, they're the ones that are getting all of the money that we are spending instead of it going to the people that are producing the bananas. And so I just want to encourage all the students uh, to come on board. And I want to quote Michael Moore, uh, you know, the, uh, the documentary filmmaker. Uh, he, this is what he says. He says, when we wake up in the morning, we wash our face, we brush our teeth, and then we call our congressman. Okay, so if we can just say uh, that we have to make that part uh, of our life, and it only takes a few minutes, and of course, if we can get more people uh, to get involved. Uh, so think of ourselves, as I said before, as organizers, uh, as people are going to empower others. So always think of recruiting other folks, other students that you know, members of your family to also engage. And it only takes a few minutes to, to send an email. And if you can't send an email, you can write a letter or you can pick up the phone and call your senator, your congressman to make sure that we get some of this legislation passed, okay? Because no matter how much we demonstrate, at the end of the day, it's got to be put into a law. And then, so that's why we have to like great people like Dr. Rivera, who's with us here today, uh, to make sure that we get progressive candidates elected that are going to enact the legislation and, and pass the laws that are going to affect us and our families. Si se puede, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. And I know that we're coming a little bit short on time, and I would just like to thank everybody that submitted the question. Also, thank the panelists who took the time to type uh, a response to those questions. I see Dr. Nadia uh, definitely uh, typed some of those questions. Um, and as we're coming up to wrap up, I just want to give you an opportunity to 
uh, talk a little bit how we can follow your work, where do we can find out what is it that you're currently working on or what you're doing and how can we support um, the causes that you are representing or is it anything or last message that you would like to give to the students that are here with us tonight? Well, for, for myself, you can go to DoloresHorta.org. Uh, that is our website. And you can, uh, uh, in your cell phone, say join DHF.org, okay? And become become part of our social justice movement. And by the way, I, you know, I really support young people, but I do have to say, I'm going to be 91 years old in April. <laughs> Felicidades. Hey. I just want to thank everybody. Uh, for their wonderful, um, and the students in particular who organized this wonderful panel. I'm very proud of them. Uh, and uh, everyone at San Diego State really looks forward to, um, you know, the pandemic ending. And I think the main thing that I am uh, very committed to is supporting our students in their journey. Uh, and so to the extent we can support our students collectively, I think that's the most important thing we can do. So thank you. Um, I'll just step in and say, um, you can follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook under the Lopez Effect. Um, and you can see my work there or as well as my website, www.thelopezeffect.com. And if I could leave these parting words for our young people, it's important now to start taking care of yourselves and create boundaries. Um, I think that we all have, um, will share our work and share the passion of our work. And there's a lot of pressure for there to be transformation and change all the time and get things done. And you as young people have so much energy, but in the midst of it, you have to make time for self-care. You have to make time to step away and disconnect and replenish yourselves, right? Because we all want to live to be the age of Senora Huerta, like 91, my grandmother lived to 99, 98, right before her 99th birthday, which is March 17th, that's coming up. Um, I just, I want you to know that everything doesn't have to be fixed in a day, but draw on your community, get people to work with you in, con in conjunction towards a larger goal do not feel like you have to have the pressure of changing the world. Thank you. I was just gonna to jump in real quick. Um, my music, my, my art, that it all is tied into a lot of this revolutionary work that we've been talking about. Um, it's available just on all streaming platforms. We have some incredibly exciting campaigns, projects that we're putting out in a really creative way in partnership with NDN Collective. Uh, which is a philanthropic organization that focuses on the liberation of indigenous uh, communities and our, and our relatives and allies. Um, and so you can find the music there. You can follow me on social media at Shutezcat, which is X-I-U-H-T-E-Z-C-A-T-L. I can put it on the chat. Um, but I think also, you know, the local, there's like so much incredible local organizing that's happening in y'all's community. And I, I encourage y'all to tap in with that, like the resources, um, you know, at the LSU, like different community members, whether it's, you know, local political organizing, um, the Kumeya Nation, like oftentimes we, we, we acknowledge land and talk about indigenous people as like this abstract, you know, oh, this is the land of the people who used to be here, but like, they're just like right outside of San Diego, you know, like go, you know, it's really important to understand that like we can interact and build coalitions and solidarity with folks and like colonial borders don't mean anything really. Like they uh, can't, they shouldn't limit our imagination of who we partner and build with to, you know, progress the work that we know is important for our communities, for our people. Um, I think for folks that have Mexican heritage who are from Mexico, um, there are the, some work that I've been doing lately to reclaim language is through this, this account called Speak Nahuac on Instagram, just look up Speak Nahuac. And there's 1.6 million people in Mexico that are, that are Nahuablantes that are speaking their language. And language is one really powerful way to reconnect to our culture. I saw that as a question that popped up in, in, in the question section. So, you know, whether you're from Mexico or other parts of Latin America or from the States, you know, um, language is an important place to understand and think and, you know, uh, progress our understanding of who we are, of where we're from further even than just a banner identity of Latino, you know, because there's a lot of indigenous communities and cultures that are erased when we talk about Latinidad. 
um, and not really acknowledging the folks, you know, and the, the specific indigenous cultures that, that many of us come from have ancestry in. So anyways, I'm grateful for all the work here. And uh, yeah, I look forward to, to staying in contact with, with all y'all. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you for, for asking. Um, I love this question because as I mentioned, San Diego State University is in um, San Diego City Council District 9. Um, the students who live on campus or around campus, um, you are District 9 constituents, meaning one, you are my boss, um, I answer to you. Um, and we talked about power before. And so um, San Diego, the students of San Diego State have a really incredible opportunity when it comes to power. If you all decided to, you could be a de the decisive voice in the political agenda of a council district in you know, one of the biggest cities in America, the second biggest city in California. You really just need to kind of act upon that. Um, and, and so I think that's an incredible opportunity there. And I hope that um, the students seize their power, um, own their power, um, because the agenda that you all will push for I think is very much in line with, again, the world that I, I would like to see. Um, I will just tell you very briefly, um, we are fighting to make housing affordable for everyone. We wanna end homelessness. Um, we wanna uh, meaningfully address climate change and make all of our neighborhoods um, healthier and more livable. We want a just justice system that holds the most powerful, the most accountable, um, that thinks about public safety in a holistic way. Um, not about law enforcement, but what actually makes each of us as individuals feel safe uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And we want to make sure that there's economic and educational opportunity for everyone. That's the agenda we show up to fight for every day in our council office. Um, you all can push us to do more. You can give us your specific ideas that you'd like to see. You can try to get involved in the work that we're doing. Um, so I'm going to drop a link to our Instagram account. We're very responsive there. Um, and, and so you can reach out to us that way. You can keep up to date on what we're, what we're, we're working on, what we're fighting for there. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that's it, y'all. Just you know, get involved and push us because um, your voices really do matter to us. Um, I wanna also just thank again, the organizers of today's event, um, the, the students who did this, um, uh, Rebecca, Serena and Nora, I really, really appreciate y'all doing this. Quite a panel y'all put together. Um, again, humbled to be a part of it. Um, and I, I just am deeply appreciative for the work that you all are doing, the community that you're creating on your campus. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you. Gracias. And, you know, just to wrap up, I would like to thank all the panelists for the work that you're doing um, and for definitely representing for our communities. And I know that this conversation is it's just a small conversation to the bigger things that we are up against. So I really thank you for your insight um, and what you shared with us tonight. Um, to the students or the people watching tonight, I just want to remind you that we are amidst a huge monumental moment right now. I know that we are. Sometimes all these issues can be very daunting and very hard to digest. So I just, you know, like Dr. Nadia Lopez mentioned, creating boundaries and making sure that you do take care of yourself as we move forward, being that we know we this is a long race that we're in. Um, and just know that, you know, if you do have the capacity to also be in support of the communities that you do inhabit, whether that be your neighbors, helping them fill out fly, you know, how to get acquire resources. I know that a lot of us uh, who are college students often become the resource centers within our local community. So it's important to share um, that information with our neighbors. Um, this recording is also going to be available should you want to share it within your own respective communities and continue the conversations that we're having. Um, also, as you said in the chat, joining the Latinx Student Union um, to see effective change and to promote what's going on in, in San Diego State, in San Diego, um, is very important. Um, again, thank you so much to all the panelists and everybody present. My name is Yosimar Reyes, and it's been a true honor um, to be moderating this conversation with all of you. Now, I would like to uh, pass it on to Rebecca, who will introduce Dr. Maria Ibarra, the professor and department chair of the Chicano Chicana Studies. Yes, thank you, Yosimar. Definitely, I want to once again thank everybody, especially the panelists and Yosimar for go ahead and moderating the panel, just because I know you guys took time out of your day. And I want to thank you for the continuous change you guys are making in our communities, the change you have made and you continue to make. Um, I know a lot of us are going to take away knowledge um, and advice that you guys gave us today to make that 
change in our community, especially here at SDSU, the Latinx Student Union. So thank you everybody for making it once again. And then we're gonna move on now. And I'm a pr I present to you guys, um, Dr. Maria Ibarra, who's gonna go ahead and um, talk about the plaque. Muchas gracias. And thank you to everyone for the wonderful conversation tonight. Uh, on behalf of many, many offices and individuals, it is my great privilege tonight to announce the dedication of a plaque in recognition of Dolores Huerta at San Diego State University. We offer this de todo corazón as a physical marker that reminds us of some of the historic accomplishments of one of the world's most recognized labor and civil rights leaders. For many people in our communities, especially those who come from farm worker families, this plaque also signifies that our lives as well are worthy of memorialization. This plaque is found in a beautiful spot on the campus, the bridge at Scripps Cottage, one, of, uh, one which hundreds of students cross every day. Uh, before COVID and hopefully after COVID. It is above a small pan, pond surrounded by trees. The location can now be described as a site of conscience, a site that not only invites critical reflection, but also dialogue, empowerment, and action. The plaque reads, as uh, hopefully everybody can see, Dolores Huerta, 1930 to present, Si se puede, yes we can, in honor of the feminist labor leader Dolores Huerta for her lifelong commitment to La Causa, the cause of social justice for working class and immigrant communities. She raised our moral awareness and advanced the civil rights of millions of farm workers. Que viva Dolores Huerta y que viva La Causa. Thank you. Oh my goodness. I, I, I am so thrilled. Uh, I, I am very, very thrilled. It, it is so beautiful. Uh, thank you for those amazing words on there. I feel very honored and at the same time very humble. And I hope to visit the plaque very, very soon. So thank you so much. I mean, I thank you. I, I just don't have the words uh, to really describe the way that I feel. Uh, this has really touched me. Uh, I have a son, by the way, that lives in San Diego. So I'm going to have, he's going to have in a, in a, one of my granddaughters. And uh, they're going to be thrilled when I tell them that this, this plaque exists. And I hope to get down there as soon as I can. <laughs> now that we're, we're all get vaccinated uh, to go visit the campus. And, and hopefully, uh, the, as I said earlier, that we can all come together again. I really appreciate that so very, very much. And, and I do want to say to everybody out there, and you know, usually when I do a lecture, I end up with a chant. And maybe before we close, uh, if I could get permission to do that chant with everybody, I would appreciate it. Okay. But, but muchas gracias. Me siento muy, muy honrada y humilde. And, and you know, when I, when I get these kind of recognitions, I always remind people that it comes on the backs of so many farm workers, of farm workers that lost their lives, you know. Uh, we had five martyrs that were killed in the Farm Workers Union. And the first one was a student, actually, a young Jewish student named Nan Friedman. Our second martyr was a, a, a Muslim, Najit Aipala, a young man from Yemen. Our third martyr was, of course, a Catholic, Juan de la Cruz. And then we had two other martyrs, Rufino Contreras and uh, Rene Lopez. So when I get these recognitions, I think about them. Uh, people don't know their names. They know my name, they know Cesar Chavez's name, but they don't know their names. And the hundreds of farm workers that, you know, that sacrificed many who lost their homes, that were beaten in jail. And so it, it is on, on their behalf that I thank you very much for this honor. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you.
Sorry. Okay. Thank you everyone for coming. We just have a few events coming up for um, our, our organization. We have one on March 29th um, with Dr. Nadia uh, Lopez. We have one on April 6th, which the registration link is to be determined right now. Um, April 19th, we have one with uh, Cindy and then we have one on April 21st and then I will drop all the links in the chat right now. Thank you all um, co for coming. We appreciate it so much. But yes, I will put all the links in the chat right now. And to close off, Dolores, do you wanna lead us in that chat? Yes, okay. Um, and this is a very simple chat. And I want to say to everybody, uh, when you have your meetings, uh, use this chat when you end your meetings, okay? And it's very, very simple. I'm going to, and I, if people can unmute, them, unmute themselves, it would be really good. And so I'm going to ask you the question. It's a very simple one. The question is, who has the power? And I want you to answer, we have the power. And when I say, what kind of power? I want you to say, people power. Can we do that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go. Okay. One, two, three. Who's got the power? We got, we got, the, got power. the power. We got the power. What kind of power? People, People power. power. <laughs> All right. So are we going to use our power? What do we say? Se puede o no se puede? Si se puede. Okay, so let's all end up with an organized hand clap saying si se puede. Let's go. Si se puede. 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 puede. You created a whole eco chamber. Yes. Um, Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Rebecca, Serena, thank you so much for all the organizers. Nora, who's in the background, um, putting all this together. This was definitely, definitely very amazing. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Que pasen buenas noches. I don't know if the student organizers have some last words as we close up. Thank you. Yeah, once again, we just want to thank everybody, including the panelists, our moderator, Yosimad, and all the students who attended today. We hopefully you guys are able to take um, something back home into your communities to be able to share the knowledge that was given to us today and the advice that um, our panelists shared with us as well. And then if you have any questions, um, you can go ahead and contact us in the email there. And then this recording will be made available to all of those who attended in a future email, which will also have a follow-up form for you guys to go ahead and have some tips on how to um, further um, your leadership skills and things like that. So once again, thank you everybody for coming and attending. And if you have any questions, make sure to put it in the chat and follow us on Instagram for events that we're gonna host in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh...